Welcome to Pod Revisited, episode 31, and we're covering chapter 13, The Very Secret Diary. Or, as we like to call it, Smarmiest Git. All right, so the book starts off with the fact that Hermione was taken to the hospital wing, and she's basically there for several weeks, and I was thinking that the fact that in this book, Hermione spends like half of her school year in the hospital wing. <laughs> Yeah, she really does. I mean, she's there now because of the Polyjuice Potion incident and turning herself into a cat or a cat-like human, which is rough. And yeah, she shows up later too. So uh, if you think about it, she goes to the hospital wing at Christmas time, which is in end of December. And I don't think she leaves until beginning of February. So she's there for like two months. And then I don't, I'm not sure when she gets attacked, but it's around like, I'm thinking like March or April. So then she's just like four months in the hospital wing. Yeah. Pretty bananas. And then there's the fact that, like, she has all this schoolwork. And, I mean, she's having Ron and Harry bring her her homework. And so she's staying up to date on the assignments. But she's not attending any of her lectures. So she has no aid from her teachers or no, like, practical skills that she's gaining. Because she's not in the classroom. So she's just doing all of her assignments based on, I guess, the textbooks. Or worse, Harry and Ron's notes. That's, that's horrendous that I, I i don't think i'd be able to keep up to date on my assignments like that thankfully i feel like hermione is a very like like a book person so she's able to i think teach herself through the textbook but not all students are like that yeah some people need some people are like auditory learners they need to have it said to them for it to really sink in i would think that if she's away for school for that long the teachers would be giving her like more like instructions on what to do since she can't come to the actual lessons like if you miss one or two days like whatever it's you catch up but like she's gone for like, like two months yeah it's crazy so that's, it's, that's it's a very... lot, lot of class time to miss she, there's no way she could keep up with all the like practical spells that they might be learning alone in the hospital wing you know i also think it's pretty hilarious, A, that Gilderoy Lockhart wrote her a get well soon card, and B, that he listed off all yes. of his <laughs> accolades and accomplishments in it. Like, could you imagine being like, hope you get well soon, Tory Hill, third grade spelling champ, participation trophy in fifth grade Harrier. Yeah, could you imagine? It's the most obnoxious thing I've ever heard of. Hermione appreciates it so much she keeps it under her pillow, which Ron discovers, which is hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that's such a goofy teenage girl thing. Like, I could picture teenage me sleeping with, like, a... I had an autographed picture of Orlando Bloom as, like, a lesson Lord of the Rings. And I didn't sleep with it under my pillow. But I only think I didn't do that because the frame was, like, glass and it would have hurt. I, I think it, I, like, that level of... I, I get it. <laughs> I can see why she would be doing that. I also think it's super cute that Ron is obviously kind of low-key jealous. He's like, she's just, she got it under her pillow. What's so great about Lockhart? What does she even see in that guy? Because he's kind of venting about it to Harry, and they're just kind of like, Larry's, like, Lockhart's the smarmiest git you know, right? And I don't think Ron is aware of his feelings. I don't even think Hermione's aware of her feelings yet. I don't really think it comes into fruition to them from a fourth year. But it is it is really funny that Ron is kind of like put out by like how much Hermione obviously like worships Gilderoy and him and Harry are obviously like, this guy's an idiot. Like, what, what do you see in him? Yeah, it's, it's very cute in a 12 year old way. But I think it's also the fact that like girls obviously I think mature faster than boys so Hermione's like in the, the crush stage of like her adolescence but Harry and Ron are still kind of just like girls what? Girls have cooties except Hermione she's not a normal girl like well they didn't really see her as a girl it's just they're she's just their friend so like they're just very much like that that's weird like like he's an idiot and obviously he is an idiot but like yeah Hermione's just kind of like growing up before the boys and like they don't really see what's going on until like the following year when Harry gets his crush on Cho Chang and everything so it's actually such an interesting concept because like they've done a lot of like research into like why girls end up having their celebrity crushes so early and it's apparently very healthy for development because once you develop attract attraction you're still too young to sort of act on it in any way so having an attraction to like a, a celebrity or like a fictional character is, is a healthy way to start to engage with those feelings without being at risk of anyone like taking advantage at you when you're young because they're not real or they're in no way part of your life and they can't connect with you. So it's actually a very healthy early stage way for young people to start engaging with romantic feelings and stuff. And it keeps them safe from having any like risky behaviors or interactions but also like 
allows them to engage with those feelings. And so I get it. Like, it's a very practical thing. I'm trying to think who my first celebrity crush was. My parents say that it was one of the kids from Bernie. Really? I can't remember which one. I had, like, I feel like I always had a crush on somebody. Celebrity-wise, I had a crush on Goku from Dragon Ball Z pretty early on. Don't judge me. He was very cool. And then I think... I wasn't allowed to watch Dragon Ball Z, so... <laughs> I went through a whole phase of Lord of the Rings crushes. Like, my first crush in Lord of the Rings was Frodo, which I don't understand now. But I think at the time it was because I was also small and confused and complained a lot. And then I sort of moved on to Legolas. And I think that's because I didn't realize I was into girls. And he's very beautiful in a traditionally feminine way. And then I moved on to Aragorn because I was like, I could just like women and also Aragorn. Well, moving on. After when Harry and Huron are going back to the common room complaining about Lockhart, they hear some yelling and it's obviously Filch. So they go to eavesdrop as they do. Moaning Myrtle has flooded like the whole corridor and Filch is complaining and I kind of feel bad for him because he's complaining that he's going to be like mopping all night and because he can't do magic and he's going to go complain to Dumbledore and this is why Hogwarts should have HR because he's being taken advantage of. Yeah, Dumbledore is not going to do anything. So where can he go to make a complaint against Dumbledore without getting like reprimanded because Dumbledore is basically his boss. HR. Yeah. Like, it would literally take him all night, and, like, probably a smart third-year student could clean it all up with one spell. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's terrible. I don't know what Filch did to deserve this. Like, he's not great. I don't like him. He's not likable. But also, I'd be miserable if I were him, too. So yeah, I kinda there like... must be a reason why Dumbledore keeps him, because everyone employed at Hogwarts, there's a reason why they're there. Yeah. Half the staff shouldn't be teaching or there in the first place, but they are because Dumbledore has a reason for them to be there. Yeah. How does filch cleaning help Harry Potter? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just think Dumbledore just w w wanted someone to torment, you know? Yeah. He's His a more evil tendencies. He's like, I need to see someone suffer. Dumbledore is such a dick. I, uh... I think it's funny how once they go into the bathroom and Moaning Myrtle is talking about the diary that was thrown at her, Harry's like, how can a book even be dangerous? Except British. So how can a book even be dangerous? <laughs> Sorry, Brits. Um, <laughs> which is hilarious because it's a very dangerous book. But it's also funny because Ron talks about how books are totally dangerous in the wizarding world to the extent that like there's books that curse you. There's books that bite the monster book of monsters. Like there's a lot of like physically dangerous books. But I think it's interesting because I think if Hermione were there, because of the way she thinks, she would also bring forth the fact that, like, books are also harmful even if they don't physically do anything to you. I mean, because ideas are harmful, right? If you write a book that's incredibly judgmental of a certain group of people and people read it, they could believe it and then start to form those beliefs and act on those beliefs. Like... You could create a book about a fictional character. People could start to believe the fictional character and engage in behaviors based on that behavior, sort of like the actual Slenderman crimes that exist in real life. You read a story and you believed it and you acted in the real world based on that. Like, books are so harmful. Yeah. It also kind of reminds me of the, the Horcrux book that, that used to be in the Hogwarts library before Dumbledore removed it. Yeah, exactly. And also, like, the Half-Blood Prince textbook that had the spells in it. Also kind of dangerous. Absolutely. Harry just ignores Ron and picks up the diary and it looks just like an ordinary diary that was never filled in. But Harry notices that it belongs to T.M. Riddle, who Ron just happens to know. Like for the first time ever, Ron's like, I know who that is. He's like, finally, the obscure knowledge that I know. Feast your eyes on this, Hermione. <laughs> I do like that it's just not even just like some random like Wizarding World Society thing that Ron usually does know, but it's just, it was just because he was cleaning the trophy. <laughs> yeah, I was throwing up slugs the other day. The best part is not only does he know something Hermione doesn't know, he knows it because he read it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Which just makes it even better. Yeah, so it turns out Tom Riddle is the owner of the diary and Harry assumes he's a muggle-born because the diary was purchased in muggle London. Yeah huge huge leap of judgment there harry potter well i thought it was interesting that like harry's kind of thinking that this diary must have been around when, when the, like, the chamber of secrets was around and um when they're going through the diary because ron is kind of like the diary is stupid like why are you keeping it it's like useless but harry just like feels compelled to keep it which i'll talk about a bit later but um he's like like harry's like what could tom riddle like have a trophy for like like there must be a connection here 
And Ron's like, maybe he killed Myrtle. He actually did. <laughs> yeah, in fact, correct. He did, in fact, kill Moaning Myrtle. Good for you, Tom Myrtle. Oh, man. What an awful joke to make when you actually think about it. Like, let's joke about the death of this 13-year-old girl. Isn't that funny? But it's also the kind of thing that you do joke about at that age because you don't really, you're like, because when we read it, we were like, ha, 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 I'm 11 and this is funny. So I can see how them as 11-year-old characters or 12-year-old characters would also say it and think it's funny. Yeah, I think when you think of Bonnie Murrow, I never really thought of her as like a person. It's always, she's a ghost and it's just like, that's what she is in the book. But reading as an adult, you're like, well, well, she was a person who died and became a ghost. And she's also a child. So it's a lot more context when you're reading it as like an adult. It was a, it was a good call for her to keep that diary. <laughs> it was a... I just want to talk about Harry being a Horcrux for a bit, as I always do. Spoiler alert! Harry's a Horcrux! Oh my god, it's been out since 2007. <laughs> so Harry's very connected to the diary. Like, he talks about how Ron's just telling him to get rid of it. Like, why does he keep it? Because they're, they're, they've looked through it and there's nothing written in it. There's It's just an old diary no one ever wrote in. But Harry just feels, like, connected to the diary and even to Tom Riddle. Like, he talks about feeling he knew him. Like, he was a friend or something that he had. And I'm wondering if this connection Harry seems to have is because the diary is also a horcrux. So it's like the two parts of the soul of Voldemort are just like, I don't know, like there's some kind of yeah bond connecting them together. Yeah, it's like when you get run into a cousin you haven't seen in a few years, but you fall into friendship real quick. I feel like that's what the horcrux pieces are like. They're like, oh, I'm comfortable with you. You're kind of new and fresh, but I feel comfortable. Because I also find it very interesting because we know horcruxes like containers are meant to protect like the soul within and harry's con is a container so he actually ends up like destroying the horror crux so i was wondering like i would you would think it wanted to protect itself but because it senses the soul in harry it's like okay we're safe because we're both like we're both being protected here yeah it's very uh multi-layered when you think about like was there a piece of harry inside of harry when he when he tries to destroy the horror crux it's like no no my brother or does each horcrux piece, though recognizing each other, value its own existence more and just sort of... I would assume it values each, each, its own, like, survival more. Yeah. Because it's Voldemort and he would value his own survival more. So each piece sort of sees itself as separate and tries to protect itself above all else. So the piece in Harry will be quiet and let him kill other pieces of horcrux because it's like, fuck that guy, at least I'm okay. Yeah. I think above all, I feel like they do they do sense the connection there that they're, they're both like the same yeah. soul. So there's there's the connection that Harry's feeling because he's a person, not just like an inanimate object. Like he's not a, a usual Horcrux container. He's very different. So he definitely feels the bond in like a different way. But I also think that Horcrux is generally it's a it's like your survival above all else. So like like you can appreciate their soul, but like push comes to shove, it's like you over anything else. It wants to survive. Yeah. Now, moving away from Horcrux, Harry, everyone's kind of still talking about the attack. So the attacks haven't happened for quite a while. So everyone's starting to feel a bit safer. Ernie still suspects Harry. And, you know. Classic. Picking Ernie. And Hildroy thinks he's the reason why the attacks have stopped, of course. Of course. I mean, why else would they possibly have been stopped? It's got to be Gilderoy. It's got to be. Yeah. To raise the school's morale, he decides he's going to plan a little thing. A surprise and they find out what it is the next morning which happens to be valentine's oh. day where he has this whole valentine's day extravaganza thing planned and i'm just like who let him do this first of all valentine's day is the worst holiday hands down the worst second of all obviously dumbledore allowed it because it's chaotic yep the professors are not happy <laughs> like it's the worst holiday it's just like time for that time of year where we make people who aren't in a relationship feel bad for some reason and we let people feel unloved and it's just very commercialized we're just not, not like it it's the most commercialized unnecessary do you remember our anti-valentine's day party when we were in high school did we watch horror movies i yeah really gory movies and just yeah i love that for us as a as a single group we did good with our anti-Valentine's Day party. Didn't we have like a pinata or something that we smashed? Oh my gosh, yeah, we did. We had like a heart-shaped pinata to beat up. I love that. I uh, I think that Voldemort brought Voldemort. <laughs> Voldemort. Dumbledore. <laughs> I thought 
that's a Freudian slip and a half. I think that Dumbledore probably allowed it because he's like, that's chaotic and it's ridiculous and it'll be great. And he probably also thought Harry Potter would love some Valentines or hate some Valentines. But either way, it'll be a character moment for Harry Potter. He, well, look, Dumbledore just likes to see the school suffer for fun. Everyone always jokes about how obsessed with Harry Voldemort is. But I don't think we spend enough time thinking about how obsessed with Harry Dumbledore is. <laughs> Literally everything he does is for Harry, despite it being... It's for Harry, despite of Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's our goods things. It's like, Harry, I'm gonna have this happen because Harry, it needs to happen for Harry. But Harry doesn't want it to happen. Yeah. Harry needs to learn this lesson, so I'm gonna have him suffer in a way that I personally arrange. So the idea of this Valentine's Day is that Lockhart has basically, I, I'm assuming he hired these dwarves to act as cupids to deliver Valentine's to students throughout the day at school, which schools usually do, which I think is stupid. I remember yeah, Valentine's Day at school was always kind of weird because no one liked me ever. Like, I remember in elementary school, it was, like, kind of nice because everyone just gave their cards and candy and it was fun. But as you get older, it's like you, did, you weren't forced to include everyone and then it just becomes kind of, like, a popularity contest and it's just very... I wanted to say it's, it's just putting people on the spot, which I hate. I hate stuff like that where, like, if you get one... It's, it's putting you on the spot. And if, like, you don't get one, it's putting you on the spot. Yeah. I found it really weird. Like, I remember specifically in primary school when you had to give everybody in your class a valentine. And I remember sitting on the floor in my parents' basement looking at my Lizzie McGuire valentines and trying to pick out which ones I liked better to give to the people I liked and which ones I didn't like as much to give to the people I didn't like. I kind of did the same thing. I, I, the cards that I thought looked the best, I'm like, I'll give these to my friends. And then the ones that, like, were just, like, general ones. But I think it was just that, that this is our first time, I think, that dwarves are ever mentioned, really, in the series. And, and I think it's kind of they're not really mentioned again yeah. off the top of my head. I just feel like obviously like the series doesn't really incorporate a great representation of of magical creatures in the series. Like they're always like seen below wizards and they're always just there to like yeah. for the wizards to use basically. Serve the wizards, yeah. So that's why I'm saying I'm hoping he hired them because I don't want kind of like their help out situation where they're basically embarrassed and like forced to do a job that's embarrassing. Mm. I feel like there's two ways you can picture them because we get kind of no context. So you can either picture them the dwarves as almost enchanted lawn gnomes like you know those like tacky ceramic gnomes with the beards and the little santa hats you could imagine it like that where like maybe they were inanimate and he like literally had like mcgonagall charm them into being somewhat sentient to hand out cards which is cute and nobody was harmed or my personal favorite is i picture like tolkien dwarves in that they're short thick covered in like dirt because they're miners and they're grimy and they've got beards and axes I like they're there because it's like the off season of mining or something and they're just like they're being paid to be there but they're gruff and angry. I don't know how I pictured them but I think I picture them now as like D&D dwarves which is very interesting. <laughs> I just I had something about like a big gruff mining like a Gimli or a being like here is your valentine. With ah. <laughs> uh, golden cupid wings and a bow. Yeah primarily Scottish. <laughs> Slightly angry dwarves. Mildly inconvenienced by the entire situation, but they're paid to be there. Um, so moving on, I think it's kind of funny how when they're learning about how what Tom Riddle was like and how he was super great and a prefect and all that jazz, they're like, wow, he sounds like Percy. Percy could have gone evil. He could have gone dark. He's generally a good guy. He just has really high ambitions and that kind of blurs his like, you know, his perspective on what is good and evil. Yeah. He would never break the rules enough to be a bad guy. You know what I mean? Like he's, <laughs> no, he just wouldn't do that. But it's such a funny comparison knowing that it's Voldemort. But like, oh yeah, Percy, Voldemort, same guy. It just kind of all adds how they all, how they all see Percy and then he ends up like leaving the family. And I'm like, well. Well, that's what you get for being dicks to Percy because he tried hard and paid attention in class. They always say that Fred and George are the black sheep of the family, but it's literally Percy. <laughs> it's Percy, yeah. 100%. I, I can't wait to talk about Percy more later, but, um... We have a lot to say about Percy Weasley as a character, I think. There's a lot going on there. But, um, we get a little bit of a tidbit of, uh, how things are coming along for the curing of the petrified students and Miss Norris, in that, uh, 
we get a, an update on how the mandrakes are doing and apparently they are teenagers so they're just waiting for their acne to clear up before they can be repotted and i absolutely love that as a concept especially as a teenager reading them and having acne being like even them you know they're just going through their awkward teenage phase they've got some acne they're trying to discover themselves you know they're a little confused about how they can listen to Bring Me the Horizon and Taylor Swift. What does that say about them as a person? That's so inconsistent. Um, I love that. I like <laughs> the how they're described are as moody and secretive. And I'm like, well, that was me. <laughs> Spot on. They wear too much eyeliner and they have side bangs. They cannot see through one eye for fashion. <laughs> Another thing based sort of around the uh, whole Valentine's Day situation is that they bring up love potions. And, you know, good old Gilderoy being like, maybe Professor Snape will whip you up a love potion. First of all, no. <laughs> Professor Snape will totally not do... He, he, Snape will not make you a love potion. Asking Severus Snape to make you a love potion is stupid. Yeah, Snape looks like he would poison you if you asked him to do a love potion. Yeah, really, really stupid. But also, Severus Snape wouldn't have to make me a love potion. Okay, yeah, we, we get it. Yeah, my whole thing with the love potion is the fact that I I, I always think that they should be illegal Absolutely. because it's basically it's like you're you're drugging someone to have feelings that they don't have. Yeah, without their consent, you're messing with their brain to make them think things they do not think, they do not feel without their consent, and then acting based on those things that you have caused without their actual conscious consent. It's totally should be illegal. It's not funny. It's not cute. And it's kind of scary that it's actually a thing that happens in the story. Like, if it was just a one-off brief mention as a joke, it'd be like, okay, kind of an off-color joke. Yeah, we get the whole Voldemort thing, and that could, there's there's definitely theories that because Voldemort was conceived under the guise of a love potion, that that's why he, like, can't feel love and everything. But the fact that, like, also mentioned it just throughout the series, like, Romilda Vane tries to, like, drug Harry with a love potion and, like, Half-Blood Prince, and... Yeah, I don't understand how that's not, like, a serious crime. Yeah, and it's not really a big deal. They're like, oh, he's given a love potion. And Slughorn's just like, oh, that's so funny. And the more, yeah, it's just like kind of oh, brushed that way. I feel like love potions should be entirely illegal except for like medical use. So like maybe if you're like a new mother and you're dealing with postpartum depression and you're struggling to like bond with your baby, like a love potion that's not a romantic love, just to like help you feel an emotional connection to your baby until they develop a personality and you can kind of actually just like them for who they are, that would make sense. Or even like registered marriage therapists in the wizarding world maybe if you're like listen i want to bring back the spark we both would like to feel that again to see if we can get back in the habit that they give you a little bit to work on your marriage while feeling the joy i don't know like those to me are the only context like it should be treated like a medication that you need to consent to the other person needs to consent to and is only given out by like pre-approved professionals yeah it definitely should be highly regulated but it, yeah it definitely feels weird especially talking to a, to a group of students where thing, there's like hormones everywhere and that just could be there's definitely things that could happen yeah why don't you just drug someone into liking you Ugh, Lockhart is such a skis. Yeah, but I think that the whole school never doesn't take it seriously. Like, Hermione overhears it. She's like, oh, be careful, by the way. Vermil's just gonna drug you. And they just, they just don't, there's no one's really concerned about it. Like, even Ron gets the love potion. They're like, oh, whatever, we'll, we'll get you treated. And it's just like a laugh, basically. And I'm like, they were drugged. Yeah, and then even when you think about it later, Fred and George have some in their shop because Ginny's looking at them and they make the joke about how she doesn't need one because she's dating Dean Thomas or whatever. And it's like, Fred and George are like good dudes. They're they're just nice dudes. Why are they, like? And it's it's presented. The love potion concept is presented so casually that like you don't even think about it until you're a grown woman and you're like, wait, no. Well, because they always present it as like innocent intentions and like it wears off and stuff. But then when you find out, but like how Voldemort's mother, yeah, yeah. But what did you do while under the influence of it, or what happened to you while under the influence? Like it's. Yeah, I think they should be super regulated, super illegal, not taught in schools. Uh, you said Gilderoy Lockhart was sent 46 Valentine's Day cards? Yeah, so my question is how many did he send himself? <laughs> well, we know Hermione definitely sent him one because Ron kind of like, you know, he's like, please don't tell me you didn't send one. And she's like, I need to find something right now at this very minute. <laughs> but also like, that's weird. That's awkward. Like, I, because like to me, Valentine's, like, 
I guess when you're a young kid, it's kind of like, it's just, it's Valentine's Day. Everyone gets a Valentine, so they know they're appreciated. But the real purpose of Valentine's Day is, like, love. Maybe not just romantic love. Like, you can get your best friend a Valentine or your mom a Valentine, and it's entirely, sure, that's part of the purpose of Valentine's Day as far as I'm concerned. But, like, giving your teacher a Valentine, like, just one teacher of yours a Valentine Seems a bit weird. Like, what do you write? Like, happy Valentine's Day, Lockhart. I hope your heart is full of joy and warmth and me this year. Like, what? What? Oh, it's so awkward. Well, speaking of awkward, Jenny, we find out, has sent Harry a musical Valentine. Oh, I would <laughs> die. Listen, I'm like an empathetic person, I guess. Like, regularly empathetic, but... Of all the emotions, the one for which I am the most empathetic is embarrassment. Like, I can't watch comedies where there's any embarrassment humor. I can't handle it. It makes me so uncomfortable. I could throw up. Yeah, I get, I get very ha- bad secondhand embarrassment. But I do kind of wish that had this, this had been in the films because I think it would be hilarious. Oh, no, I would hurt me. It would physically hurt me to see this in the films. And it physically hurts me to read it. I'm like, I feel so grossed out and, like, embarrassed for Harry. Like, I just want to, like, dissolve into nothingness and disappear and, like, slither like a worm down the carpet and disappear. Like, that's what I picture. Dissolving of embarrassment, becoming a worm, and, like, worm crawling out of frame because it's the most embarrassing. But then you think how embarrassing it is for Ginny, seeing how horrified Harry is. And I'm just like, oh, I can't. I'm not made to handle this. Like, I could not live that life. That is horrendous. Going back to just how we see this from Harry's perspective. So he obviously is 12 years old, a boy. He's not really interested in girls yet. And he is targeted in the middle of a busy quarter in between classes by the by the dwarf. And he tries to make a break for it because I feel like this is every like preteen's like worst nightmare is obviously being given a Valentine in public. In public and when like in front of everyone. And the fact that it is also a musical Valentine, it's just like it's all it hits all the boxes for super embarrassing. And it also happens in front of Jenny, which is also super embarrassing because I think Harry is aware that she probably sent it. So Harry's a nice guy, he doesn't want to embarrass her. I don't think he's aware at first because he's not particularly um, intuitive. Everyone else is kind of aware. Everyone else is like, hmm. And then Draco kind of sits. So Harry, of course, is attacked by the dwarf and he has sung this beautiful poem from Jenny. Iconic. We all know it. It makes me so, 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 so embarrassed. And his break, his Bag is broken in the process, and Draco, of course, takes this moment to steal Harry, what he assumes is Harry's diary, which is so funny that he thinks Harry has a diary. <laughs> and what does he think he's written in it? <laughs> I would love to. I feel like Harry's diary would be like, the Dursleys are awful. I do not miss them. Had a good day with Ron today. Early Quidditch. Hermione helped me with homework. Still don't understand this topic in class. We'll ask Hermione again later. Have Quidditch tomorrow. My parents are dead. Like that's, <laughs> that's Harry's yeah, diary. Yeah, I, I don't know what Drake was expecting, but um, Percy's there trying, you know, get like the chaos over as a prefect does, and Draco won't get the diary back, and Harry is too upset and embarrassed, so he uses Expelliarmus to get the diary back, and this is kind of showing that this is Harry's signature spell. He's like, bitch, I know a spell. Do you want to come at me like that? I know one whole spell and I'm going to use it whenever I can. And because Malfoy can't be one-upped after being kind of like showing up in front of Harry again, he tells Jenny that Harry didn't like her valentine. So even Draco knows that Jenny sent the valentine. Yeah. 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 Which like, I guess is embarrassing now because they're 12 and the boy's aren't interested in girls yet but in five years when Ginny's like the most popular coolest girl in school Draco would be like shit I wish Ginny Weasley sent me a valentine like just wait Ginny your time's coming girl you got this don't worry we all go through this phase where we have bad eyebrows and weird crushes but you're gonna flower into a majestic badass and Harry's going to love you well Ron wants to try and hex Draco but of course his wand is a liability yeah and they actually describe it it like popping it has a, it's like bubbling at the end of the wand or something in the next class and I'm like Jesus this wand that's so somehow that's gross like I feel like it's crusty bubbles I don't I don't like it it's like green bubbles or something it's I'm like this wand is a liability like he should not be using this it's probably like poisoning him slowly yeah so Harry um 
after class takes his special diary upstairs to his room and he's like this is weird it's not covered in ink but everything else in my bag is dirty because he got attacked low-key by Draco. Uh, and he takes out the book and he's like, hmm, dear diary, it's me, <laughs> yeah boy, Harry Potter, what it do? And the diary is like, hello, Harry Potter, it's me, the diary. Let's be friends. Sincerely, the diary. Yeah, I'm wondering why Harry didn't kind of get a red flag that the diary is reading back to him after Ron just told him, like, books can be dangerous and have brains and can do bad things to you. And Harry's like, oh, wow, the diary is, like, actually responding to me. This is so cool. Well, I mean, I think... It's, first of all, Harry's still learning about magic. And he's probably like, oh, this is a cool magic thing. Like, he probably doesn't realize how unbelievably complex the magic would have to be. So he's kind of just like, oh, wow, fun. Like, you know those, like, online robots that were a huge phase when we were younger? Where it's like, you go online and talk to, like, I think Ikea had one. Like, the Ikea website had an automatic robot person that you could talk to about Ikea things. And you could just go and be like, how's your day going, Ikea robot? And it would be like... My day is great. I just bought the Slinkenslaw bookshelf and put it together. It's wonderful. What are you looking for? Like, that was a phase. So maybe this is like the wizard version of that. Like, oh, fun. I get to talk into the void and the void gets to talk back. I feel like Harry hid away in the dormitory because he knew Ron was kind of like weird out by the diary. And Ron was like, don't do anything with it. That diary's strange. So he went by himself. And I feel like if Ron was with him Ron had been, and Ron had seen it, he'd be like, don't do anything with that gonna suck at your soul but because harry's alone and because harry's harry he responds back classic gryffindor like oh good the book's talking to me wonderful news i do think and i really kind of appreciate that the diary is like hey i can show you what happened and harry's like oh you can show me and the diary's like yes like would you like me to show you like the diary gets harry's explicit consent before it like pulls him in and puts him in that memory like he really says like okay and the diary waits and i like i know tom riddle's a terrible person but i at least respect that it like gets permission i think at this point he definitely wants to convince harry and wants harry to think good of him to kind of like lure harry into a false sense of security so he's like yes i know all about the chamber of secrets i am the person that you should talk to and trust i do like that it show this is our first kind of entrant sorry our first kind of introduction to seeing memories because this is Harry seeing a memory of Tom Riddle's, obviously like a false memory because Hagrid was framed, but he's seeing of going back like 50 years to the past and it, we get back to that with the pensive and Goblet of Fire and obviously it's like a huge part in half with Princess the Memories. Yeah. So it's our first kind of little introduction to like, you can go view people's memories. Yeah. And they do explain it well in the book, like Harry trying to talk to, uh, the headmaster and the headmaster not seeing Harry because Harry isn't actually there. Like, it's a very nicely done. It's a good sort of gentle introduction to the concept, for sure. Yep, so the biggest thing is we, when we go back to the memory, we find out, basically, all of this, that according to Tom Riddle, Hagrid opened the Chamber of Secrets and unleashed the monster. Shocking plot twist. Totally unexpected. The first time I read it, I was like, sorry, Hagrid? I will say, as an adult looking back, reviewing the, the whole book and like what I know about Hagrid as a character who would never do anything maliciously or evil or encourage a creature to kill someone, I could totally see Hagrid bringing a dangerous creature into the school, thinking it needs him to take care of it, taking care of it, seeing the best of that creature, and like letting it get away with doing a few bad things because he's like, oh, it's just learning. Or doesn't understand the rules. And then not realizing how dangerous it was until it had done something like killed a student. Like I could see that having been a situation Hagrid gets into. Hagrid wants to see the best in animals. And like we do know that he has a thing for dangerous creatures because he wants to see the best in him. And he's all about second chances and stuff. And like I think they, the trio does talk about it in the next um, chapter. But like how like if it was Hagrid, it was obviously an accident because Hagrid would never hurt someone on purpose. And exactly. it's likely that they just he just heard about the monster and he just wanted to take care of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's 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 a very feasible thing. Like it could have been Hagrid. Um so I think it's well done in that he's like a believable suspect without being like a bad guy. It's an interesting sort of red herring, I suppose. Yeah, so this chapter's kind of short, but it's just leading up kind of all of like the little clues. 
And so, like, the next few chapters where things get, like, really serious really fast. Uh, did you keep a diary when you were growing up, when you were 12 or so? I think I attempted to keep diary. I definitely had, like, journals that I, like, would try to write in every day, but I never kept up with them, like... A lot, but yeah. I think I probably kept one until I was probably like 14. I never had like an actual like daily diary like, Dear Diary, you know who is so cute? Or you know who's the biggest jerk? But I did on multiple occasions in my life try and start dream journals where I in the morning I would write down what I remember from my dreams. And then I could like look back over them. I had, uh, I still have Carl Jung's book on dream analysis. So I would write down my dreams and then try and analyze them from a Jungian perspective. Because uh, I was weird. But I never had like a proper journal where I like thought of my conscious thoughts. Yeah, I think I, I mostly kept mine because it was only like really, I think I ever wrote in it when it's when I needed to vent about something. So usually something like bad happened and then I'd be like writing about like an event that was like I wasn't happy with. And it was more like, because like journaling is supposed to be like to get emotions out. So I feel like I was using diary is not just to talk about what my day was like but it's more just like this terrible thing happened to me at the time when I was 12 which is probably something very minor but to me it was like life and death and I'm just like like if I had a fight with my friends or like I got in trouble for something I'm like this is like the worst thing ever and I had to like vent about it but yeah it's a safe safe space uh, if you could pick any memory from your life to encapsulate in a book so that if someone was reading the book they could be pulled in and experience that memory with you what would it be? I'm trying to think of some cool things I've done that were like were actually like um, interesting enough to like re relive. But I feel like there's memories I would like to relive that were just like really good moments in my life. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be to share. It can be for you to relive yourself. I wish I could capture like just something sometime when I was scared into a book because I'm a horror fan, and to know there was a book that could be opened that immediately put me into that sense of like nervous, scared excitement. Like, I would love to have that as an option. So, like, when I really was really, really young and we'd get, like, dared by our uncles to walk to the end of the driveway at the cottage or something. And, like, it's just the end of the driveway. And, yes, it's dark and long and there's trees. But as a kid, you're so scared because you don't know anything could be in the woods. Like, I miss that. I, I would love to be able to just open a book and be transported back. Speaking of that, I think with reliving some moments, um, the I went when I went to the midnight release for Deathly Hollows, that was, like, probably when the first, I think, minute release of the movie premieres I went to and it because it was the last one it was like it was big and it was like it was so much fun not even just seeing the movie but just lining up with all of these fans that were all dressed up and just like the energy and everything like that, that was like not as good as a, a minute release party for the books but it's still like this it's around like the same area because it's like everyone's there for like a reason everyone's super excited and just like don't really get that anymore no, no, nothing is, I mean, everything's released kind of on streaming services now, so it's kind of like, oh, I'll watch it later this week when I have time at home. Yeah, we were kind of, like, grew up at that perfect time where, like, the books were still, like, half out, but they were still coming out, and the movies were coming out, like, every summer. Yeah. So, like, it was, like, either year you got, like, a book and a movie, book and a movie. Yeah, it was perfect. Thanks for listening to this episode of Potter Revisited. We will be back next time to discuss Chapter 14 of Chamber of Secrets, Cornelius Fudge. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to like us on Twitter and subscribe to us on Spotify and Apple Music and uh, tell your best friend's dog to listen in when they're home alone and need some human voices in the background. Bye!